Well, no guesses as to why I chose this passage this morning after yesterday's wedding. It is clearly about a wedding, uh, a wedding that Jesus went to uh, with his mother and his disciples, and he blessed it in this way with this miracle of water into wine. We're going to start off, we're going to launch straight in by thinking about the context of this passage. Okay. It says right at the very beginning, on, on, uh, in verse 1, on the third day. What's this all about? It's tempting to read it maybe in line with uh, in uh, in the light of Jesus' resurrection on the third day, and in fact that does actually happen. It is actually mentioned in our chapter in verses nineteen to twenty-one, but I don't think that's what's being thought about here. No, correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, I'm going to throw out some things this morning that are uh, that you can speak to me about over tea and coffee afterwards. Uh, see what you think about what I'm preaching this morning. I, I pray that I'm preaching what's right and whatever's not right be be recognised. But think about this: on the third day. If you had read the, uh, John's Gospel up to this point, you'd have heard about various days. And then you get to on the third day in chapter 2. We've had various days mentioned in chapter 1, verse 29, verse 35, and verse 43. And you see there that each of those verses, chapter 1, verse 29, starts the next day. Chapter 1, verse 35, the next day again. Chapter 1, verse 43, the next day, and then chapter 2, on the third day. So John, and, and so if you, if you count those up, you, have, you start off with the next day, which obviously implies that there's already been a day. So the, that first next day in chapter 1, verse 29, is the second day. Then you have another the next day, verse 35, another the next day, verse 43, and then on the third day, count them up, what do you get? You get seven days, right? Seven days. So John begins his gospel in the beginning, and then seven days. Is there something suggestive here? John loves us to hear double. Surely just the in the beginning that he starts his gospel is suggestive. He's wanting us to think about Genesis. He's wanting us to cast our minds back to Genesis chapter 1. Might John, as he writes this, be suggesting that our passage has something to do with the great culmination of creation, the great fulfillment of creation that happens as God rests on the seventh day and enjoys his good creation? The Sabbath. Might that have something to do with the future Sabbath wedding of Christ and his church when the church finally rests in the home of her glorious husband? Possibly. Possibly. How do these seven days in in John's Gospel pan out? Well, first of all, before the seven days, there's the prologue which peers back to before creation when there was the Word, Christ, in his pre-existent uh, self and his pre-existent deity. So you have in the beginning was the Word before creation. That is, we're peering back before creation. We're seeing the Word through whom God creates the world, and that Word was with God and was God. So that speaks about the eternal relationship between Christ and the Father and His deity, eternally so before creation. And then at the end of the prologue, we have chapter 1, verse 14. The Word became flesh. He came into creation. He became one of us. He became bone of our bone, flesh of our flesh. He enters creation. And then you have these seven days. The next day, the next day, the next day, on the third day. And how do those work. Well, you have at the beginning of those seven days, you have John the Baptist's testimony about Jesus. What does he say? He says, I'm here to make straight the way of the Lord. I'm not worthy to untie the strap of his sandals. And there he is. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. There he is. I saw the Spirit descend on him. This is the Son of God. So you have John the Baptist's testimony at the beginning of those seven days. And then following that, you have the repeated call, chapter 1, verse 39. Come and you will see. Again, verse 46. Come and see. So John the Baptist's testimony in the creation. There he is, behold the Lamb of God. Come and see. Come and see. And you also have two conversions. First of all, you have Andrew proclaiming, we have found the Messiah, chapter 1, verse 41. And then you have Nathaniel converted in an instant from complete skepticism about anything good coming from Nazareth 
to belief that this is the Son of God, the King of Israel. Okay, so far we have the eternal word before creation. He comes into creation. He becomes flesh. And then we have seven days. John the Baptist testimony. Come and see. Come and see. Conversion. Conversion. Wedding. That's where we got land on our passage. And this is called, what Jesus does in our passage, verse 11, is called a sign. It's, called, it's the first of John's signs. Uh, sorry, it's the, first, it's the first of Jesus' signs that he performs. Um, uh, first of seven. Hey, one seven leading to another. If you're not careful, that can make you think of Revelation, can't it? Maybe, maybe we won't explore that. We have one seven after another. But we have the first of the signs here. This miracle is called a sign. And what's a sign for? Well, we find out the purpose of these signs right at the end of John's Gospel, chapter 20, verse 30 and 31. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. So I hope that even though maybe I've introduced far too many things at the start of this sermon, but I hope that helps us to see how this passage fits in with John's magnificent purpose and sweep. Come and see and believe in Jesus, the glorious, eternal, pre-existent, incarnate Messiah and Son of God and have life in his name. And regarding our passage in particular, come and see the seventh day of creation, the Sabbath, fulfilled, culminated, in the glorious wedding that we see. Come and see it prefigured in this wedding that was wrecked, but that Jesus rescued. So let's think about our passage then, this wedding that Jesus and his mother and his disciples were present at. We're going to start off, first of all, with some questions that the passage raises. Um, The sign that Jesus does, and then finally some application. Some questions the passage raises, three of them. First of all, we need to just do a sort of check on what Jesus says in verse 4, because it might possibly cause us unnecessary offense. Jesus says, to his mother, woman, what does this have to do with me? He calls his mother woman, and to us in the English language, we hear that and go, whoa, that was rude. So we just, need to, we just need to sort of understand this. We need to understand that it might sound rude in English, but it doesn't necessarily sound rude in every language. We have actually got speakers of various languages here, so I'd be interested to know if, it, if, if you called your mother woman in your language, would it necessarily be rude? Tell me afterwards. But it doesn't sound rude, and we know that for certain, because on the cross, Jesus addresses his mother with exactly the same term in a moment of incredible tenderness. Chapter 19, verse 26. Jesus on the cross there speaks to his mother Mary and John, the disciple, who's standing with Mary. And he says to his mother, woman, behold your son. He's giving her a home. He's just about to die and give his life on the cross. And he makes sure that his own mother has provision. He gives her a home and he addresses a woman. Great tenderness, great compassion there. Manifestly not rude. Maybe a translation that might be suitable for this would be something like my lady. If you called a woman my lady, that, that shows respect and tenderness, doesn't it? Maybe that's a sort of English equivalent to what, what the Greek is here, but it's certainly not rude. So that's maybe, hopefully, an, off- an unnecessary offense removed. Let's think about a second puzzle, still in verse 4, where, where Jesus says, what did he say next? Well, woman, he says, or well, my lady, what does this have to do with me? And then he does this sign anyway. He does a miracle anyway. How does that work? Well, I've puzzled over that. And I have to confess, what I'm about to say you won't find any of the commentators. They all say there is an irreducible note of rebuke in what Jesus says to Mary. What does this have to do with me? They all say that Jesus there is rebuking Mary for addressing him as her son when she should have been addressing him as Lord, something like that. I just don't see that in the text. I don't see anything, any move from, him, from Mary addressing Jesus as, as a son to, and as mother to son to disciple to Christ. There's nothing, no evidence of that. So here's a possible tentative, okay, all those words. Just think about this and weigh it carefully. It may not be right, but here's what I think is possibly happening. Jesus' mother, verse 3, it seems is closely connected with the catering at the wedding. 
She finds out about the disaster in the making. And of course, it is a total disaster. People, could take, people would take each other to court for this, you know, in the ancient world, if, if the wine ran out, okay? So it's a real disaster. She mentions this disaster in the making to her son. Just like if I saw something like this happening, I, I'd, I'd tell Elaine, do you, do you know what's, what's about to happen? Possibly, okay? He mentions it, that's, sorry, um, she mentions it to him just as she does to a beloved family member. Jesus responds, verse 4, not with a rebuke, but with a question that's a bit like his question elsewhere in the Gospels, where Jesus says to the man who calls him good teacher, why do you call me good? Do you remember that? Now, does Jesus say that because he's not good? No. He, he, says, he says, why do you call me good? Only God is good. And he's surely trying to elicit from that person that he is not just good, but he's God. Now, might that principle not, might hold, uh, might that not hold for this here too? Might it not be that Jesus asks this question, verse 4, what does that have to do with me, not as a rebuke, but maybe to draw his mother to consider the implication of her innocent question to a beloved family member? And then it seems maybe the penny drops for Mary. A thrill goes down her spine as she realizes that she has just asked and mentioned this problem to one that she has known from before he was born, that he is the Son of God. That's what the Mary, uh, Gabriel said to Mary uh, way back in Luke's Gospel before she even conceives, just before she conceives Jesus in her virgin womb. And so possibly with excitement and anticipation, she tells her servant, verse 5, do whatever he tells you. She suddenly had her eyes opened that this is not just a problem that she's mentioned to a loved one. This is a problem she's mentioned to the Son of God. Do whatever he tells you. And then Jesus, of course, does this miracle. Now, it's just a possibility, but it seems maybe to make sense of the conversation. So I just throw it out there for you. Do get back to me about it. Here's a third possible, que- well, a third question our passage raises. Second half of verse 4, my hour has not yet come. What, what, what's this about? It seems, doesn't seem to follow on from the other bit, does it? My hour has not yet come. Well, we find something similar said in chapter 7, verse 30, chapter 8, verse 20. And in both those cases, people are trying to arrest Jesus. But they cannot. Why? John the narrator tells us. Because his hour had not yet come. And then Jesus' hour finally does come in chapter 12, verse 23, when Jesus says, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. What is that hour? It's the hour he's troubled at. The hour of his suffering, the hour of him going to the cross, the hour of him giving himself, laying down his life for his beloved. And so putting this all together then, Mary mentions the wine issue to Jesus, possibly as anyone would mention it to a loved one, a problem to a loved one. And Jesus is the first person to see the deeper significance of this. We'd expect that. Frequently you find um, other people, the disciples, for example, speaking on the level of the things of this life, like bread, for example, John chapter 4. They say, well, we've got no bread, and Jesus is talking about bigger things, John chapter 4, verses 32 and 33. So Jesus is the one that sees the deeper significance, the gospel significance, before Mary does. He sees that providing wedding wine deeply resonates resonates with what he became flesh for. And so verse 4 is not at all meaning, possibly, this has nothing to do with me, but rather maybe Jesus saying to Mary, yes, more than you realize, more than you said, this issue is profoundly relevant to me and what I came for. I have indeed come for such a work as this, but not yet, not yet. My hour when I do the work of providing for a joyful wedding banquet comes when I reach the hour of my death and resurrection. This will do such a thing. Maybe that's what Jesus means. And so, to reveal then these great things that Jesus has in his mind, he performs this sign, as the miracle is called in verse 11. So let's look secondly at the sign that Jesus does. What is a sign? It's something that signifies something, isn't it? Fire exit. If you were at the wedding yesterday, you would have seen a sign saying, wedding this way, or meal at three, or whatever it was. It means something, doesn't it? It points to something. It tells you about something. And so this miracle has significance. It's not just a random act. The way Jesus does it means something. It signifies something. 
How is it then that Jesus provides the wine that was so embarrassingly lacking at this wedding? He could have done it in any number of ways, couldn't he? He could have just said, the jars are now full. And they would have been. But that's not how he does it. How does he do it? Verses 6 to 8. Now there were six stone water jars there for the Jewish rites of purification, each holding 20 or 30 gallons. Jesus said to the servants, fill the jars with water. And they fill them up to the brim. And he said to them, now draw out some water and take it to the master of the feast. So they took it. When the master of the feast tasted the water, now become wine, he, and did not know where it had come from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew, the master of the feast called the bridegroom and said to him, everyone serves the good wine first, and when people have drunk freely, then the poor wine, but you have kept the good wine until now. Now, Jesus could have provided wine miraculously, as I say, in any number of ways, but he does so by filling these water jars with water, these water jars that were intended for Jewish purification rites. Now, is there not a delightful significance to this? Especially if you've been with us in the series in Leviticus over the last few Sunday mornings. We've been thinking about various rites of purification in the book of Leviticus in the Old Testament, in the Old Testament law, and thought about how Jesus fulfills them by providing a perfect purification through his blood shed at the cross, through the perfect final sacrifice at the cross. Well, that's true, but this goes further, doesn't it? This goes much further. This turns water for purification into wedding wine, the best wine, so much so that the person says, you've saved the best wine till now. Well, in a sense, that is a comment on God acting in history. Jesus coming into the world is the best wine saved till now. The heavenly banquet at the end is the best wine saved till now. And so Jesus' death and resurrection don't just make a believer clean in God's sight. They do that, but they go so much beyond that. Because Jesus, don't forget, he's talking about his hour here, Verse 4, he's thinking ahead to his suffering. And his suffering is going to do more than just purify people from their sin. It's going to do that and also bring them finally to the glorious heavenly wedding banquet that no doubt he has his mind on here. The gospel then doesn't just end up believers being washed of their sin, but also wined with the finest wine, washed, wined, and even wedded, because whose wedding is Jesus thinking ahead to? Whose wedding is he going to provide the wine for through his death and resurrection? It's his own wedding, isn't it? It's his own wedding. Now, we see that in passages like Ephesians 5. We've had that a few times this this year, haven't we, with various weddings that we've uh, been delighted to have as a church. Ephesians 5, a classic passage on the comparison between Christ and the church with um, the husband and the wife, in a, in, a, in a marriage. Revelation 21, the new Jerusalem comes down from heaven, the bride of the Lamb, the wife of the Lamb. We also have it in John's Gospel too. So just turn ahead to chapter 3, chapter 3, verses 25 to 30. <clears throat> now a discussion arose between some of, jo- some of John's, that's John the Baptist's disciples, and a Jew over purification. And they came to John and said to him, Rabbi, he who is with you across the Jordan, to whom you bore witness, look, he's baptizing, and all are going to him. John answered, A person cannot receive even one thing unless it is given him from heaven. You yourselves bear me witness that I said, I am not the Christ, but I've been sent before him. The one who has the bride is the bridegroom. The friend of the bridegroom, John himself in other words, John's the friend, who stands and hears him rejoices greatly at the bridegroom's voice. Therefore this joy of mine is now complete. He must increase, but I must decrease. So do you see the comedy is being made to John the Baptist, maybe with a sense of concern and anxiety, all are going to Jesus. Oh, verse, end of verse 26. 
Everyone's flocking to him. They're leaving you. Don't you realize people are leaving you and going to Jesus? What's John's response? This is a disaster? No. The opposite, isn't it? It's the bridegroom that has the bride, he says. The bride should go to the bridegroom, not to the friend of the bridegroom. That's a disaster. That sort of wedding's that. The bride goes to the bridegroom. She's magnetized to him. I rejoice that, he, that that's happening as he sees people flocking to Christ. He doesn't mind. He says, fine, let him increase. Let me decrease. I am glad about that, he says. John the Baptist saying that. So this sign then, Jesus is the bridegroom. The bridegroom to whom the bride comes, the bride being the people who will be saved through him. And this sign in our passage in chapter 2 points to the Lord Jesus' own future wedding then. There's a, a great sermon on this that I heard uh, a few years ago. Uh, picturing a young man going to someone else's wedding. A man who knows he's going to be married soon. What, what does a young man think about when he's going to be married soon, when he goes to a wedding? He thinks about his own wedding, doesn't he? He sees beyond this day. He thinks about his own wedding. Isn't that what's happening in our passage? Jesus thinking about his own wedding. The bridegroom thinking about his union, his coming together of his beloved, whom he's just about to lay his life down for in three years' time. And so we have... The wedding that our passage points to is the culmination of creation. It's the goal of history, the Sabbath wedding of the incarnate Son of God with the church. The Son of God himself enters history, lays down his life for his beloved. They get drawn to him by the Father. He gives them eternal life. They're wedded together. And then there's the glorious heights of the wedding day when they come together. That's what our passage points us to. Let's think about application as we close. Who is Christ's beloved? Well, in John's Gospel, it's those that the Father gives him. Those the Father draws to him. The Father draws people to his Son. And they cannot come unless the Father does that. John chapter 6. And so those whom the Father draws, they come to Christ to trust in Jesus and believe in him and receive life in his name. And so let me speak first to those who have been drawn to Christ in true repentance and faith. You've had God work in your spirit. You've had God convict you of your sin. You know you're a sinner. You've been convicted of sin and righteousness and judgment. You know you're a sinner. You know God is coming to judge. That's what Jesus talks about in John 16, 18, uh, verse 8. You know that. And so I'm talking to people like that. And you've come to Christ in faith and been relieved through the grace he's shown you and the forgiveness he's shown you. Well, what's my application to you who are in that state, you who are true believers, true born-again believers? Well, it's this. You see behind me the communion table. We're just about to share the Lord's Supper together after our next song. And our theme of Christ's glorious future wedding banquet with his church links to the Lord's Supper. Turn with me to Matthew 26 to see this. It's on page 832 in the Church Black Bibles. Matthew 26. It's the Last Supper that we're reading about here. Matthew 26, verses 26 to 29. So Jesus is in the room with his disciples, and it says, As they were eating, Jesus took bread, and after blessing it, broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. And he took the cup, and when he'd given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you, for this is the blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, verse 29, I tell you, says Jesus, I will not drink again of this fruit of the vine until that day, that day, when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. So this is the Last Supper. And you see how the wine that they're drinking points to two things. First of all, it points to the blood Jesus is just about, is just about to pour out. So we've thought about that as we've looked at various offerings in Leviticus. The pouring out of blood and the forgiveness of sins that would come through that. That cup of the Last Supper points to that. It also points ahead, you see verse 29, it also points ahead to when Jesus is next going to drink that cup. When is Jesus next going to drink wine? It's at the final wedding banquet, isn't it? 
Jesus has not drunk wine again since, this, since the Last Supper and, he, and, the, and his death and resurrection. He, his body was raised again. He hasn't drunk it still. He was ascended to heaven. He's at the Father's right hand. He still hasn't drunk any wine. He will drink it again when he drinks it with you who believe in true repentance and faith. And he's looking forward to that. Can you see him looking forward to that day when he drinks it with you on that final day in that glorious banquet in the kingdom of God? So as we take the Lord's Supper shortly and we see the great love of Christ towards us, we see these two things. We see the death he dies and the wedding banquet with you who believe that he's looking forward to. And just as Jesus' heart is drawn to his bride, his beloved, so he would have us be drawn to him in love as well. So as you take the Lord's Supper, look back to the bloodshed, look forward to the banquet to come, and let your heart be drawn to Christ in love. And finally, to those who don't yet believe in true repentance and faith, remember the context I started with of our passage. What is it? Come and see. Come and see. Come and see and believe in this one. Trust in him. Have eternal life in his name. Here Jesus is called, chapter 7, verse 37, let anyone who thirsts come to me and drink. And remember the words of Jesus in the very next chapter of John's Gospel after our passage. And this is words Jesus speaks to someone who thinks they already believe but don't actually. Someone who's committed to the Bible Someone has great respect for Jesus. Someone who's even go, willing to go out on a limb to belong to Jesus. And yet Jesus says to him, with great insight, he says, you must be born again. You won't even enter or see the kingdom of God unless you're born again. You won't even taste the wine of that wedding banquet unless you're born again. What does it mean to be born again? It means the th- three things I mentioned earlier. Conviction of sin. You need to know you're a sinner. And if you don't, you need to seek God to open your eyes to show you that you are a sinner deeply in need of Jesus and his bloodshed on the cross to save you from your sin. You need your eyes to be opened to that. And then when your eyes are opened and the Spirit works in your heart, you will flee to Christ to be saved. And then you will be one of Christ, one of his sheep, one of his beloved brides, and then you can be assured that you will taste that final wedding wine. So if you don't have that conviction of sin, if you don't know that you are in danger from the wrath of God, the judgment of God coming, finding you out, then I plead with you to seek that. that is, that's the way. That's the way you must go. Seek the Lord. Seek that from his hand. Seek him to open your eyes to see your sin as he sees it so that you flee to the Lord Jesus, the life he gave, and then you will taste, finally, the wedding banquet. Let's pray together, shall we?